Good morning, everyone. It's great to be with you to commence this series. I'm, um, I'm a very happy man today. I married my third daughter last weekend. And well, actually, Pastor Tim Lockins oversaw, did the ceremony, but I walked her down the aisle. And uh, her mother and I and, and, the Lock and, and the Hawkins family prayed the blessing on them. And so, uh, fantastic. So my baby girl is married. Hey. <laughs> and I have uh, three, now three magnificent son-in-laws, which is uh, terrific. So I only have a son to marry yet, and, uh, and, and I'm just saying, be ready, boy. You're 34. You might have to be 40 before you're married. No, no, I'm just teasing him. My dad was married at 39, and um, so, uh, yeah, I'm very, very happy, and uh, it was a, a thrilling, thrilling experience. And uh, tomorrow morning, Kathy and I uh, fly out to uh, South Africa. We're going to take a few days, uh, just a little bit of holiday to catch our breath in Cape Town, probably three or four days. I hope to visit Nelson Mandela's prison cell and actually go in there. And I've been to his house in Soweto and, and to the Apartheid Museum, which is really moving. And uh, then we go to Johannesburg, where we minister with uh, Pastor or Bishop Moses Sono. Uh, phenomenal church, Grace Bible Church. They're, they're conservatively 60,000 people. It's more like 75,000 people now in 47 sites now. So the messages are beamed across the sites, or the first one of every month, and uh, right across uh, Joburg area, which is uh, about 12 million people then throughout South Africa. And then to Swaziland, um, now called Etswinga land, and it's landlocked between Mozambique and South Africa. It's the only country that has an absolute monarch, still an absolute monarch, no parliament, no votes, no nothing. And um, he likes to get a new wife every year. <laughs> so um, I've got some makeup that I'm going to make Kathy look really ugly at the airport because his spies, his spies are there looking for beautiful women. So I'm going to make her look ugly so that uh, he doesn't kidnap her and want to marry her. So. Um, uh, Swaziland is, um, uh, there's a young, young leader who has been trying to get me to go there for a couple of years and he's planted 50 churches, I've met him a couple of times, wonderful man, uh, um, uh, and Jethro and his wife CZ and uh, they will be running their annual conference, probably about 800 men, women and children, uh, they've planted 50 churches and so I'm, I'm sharing there along with some other speakers. So uh, I initially said no, because it's around Christmas time, but uh, he prevailed. So it's my final, my final international trip for uh, this year. I've crammed in my overseas trips in the last six months of the year. And normally it's every two months or so. So I'm not traveling overseas till March next year, praise the Lord. I love being there, but I hate getting there. It's awful. But um, uh, so I certainly pray that God will uh, help us and enable us. Uh, when I went to Athens, I took about, whatever it was, 50 of my books. They all went within half an hour. So I'm hoping to take 100 if I can fit them into the bags. And they'll go very, very quickly, I'm sure. So, um, so pray that God will give us, uh, uh, whose grace will prevail and enable us to uh, effectively teach and train and help other pastors and leaders as they're, some of them, commencing their, their ministry journey. So they think I've got a few things to teach them after 40 years. So uh, I've learned two things, made 22 mistakes. I reckon that, that will be OK. Um, let there be light, our theme. Do you know light and life are mentioned right in the beginning of the Bible? And um, at the physical creation of the universe. Let's read Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth, now notice this, was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. He thought it, he spoke it, and the Spirit of God made it happen. Creation occurs, and there was light. God saw that the light was good and he separated the light 
from the darkness. Now, the rest of chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3 talks about all the various things that occurred in the physical creation. And God made it all from the beginning. But interesting that light is mentioned first. The first thing that he created was light. Do you know that life is the direct result of light? There would not be life if there was not light. All life, all life, animal life, plant life, any form of life comes from light and is actually sustained by light. So the ability for you, the, the, the capacity for you to breathe is because there's light around. Hey, do you realize that? The oxygen you breathe to live is because there's light. For you to eat and to sustain your physical health, it's because there's light around. You might say, Pastor Bill, what are you talking about? What's light got to do with oxygen? What's light got to do with the lovely animals I eat? Or if you're a vegan, the plants that I eat? Well, it's true. The study of light is one of the key foundations in the world of physics and biology. Now, when I was at high school, this is a terrible confession, I hated physics and I avoided it. Mathematics and physics, I loved biology, a little bit of chemistry, but history and and geography and the arts and but uh, biology I loved and did very well but physics I hated and it was one it's one of my regrets so I've been catching up on reading about physics and I tell you it's a world that I see the hand of God at work amazing when you think about the the Einstein's theory of relativity we all know it don't we E equals MC squared but do you know that he was only partly right. There was another guy, what's his name, Neil Bohr's, who came up with quantum mechanics, the exact opposite to relativity. And there was great fights in the early part of the 20th century about theoretical physics. And they said, oh, Bohr's, you're wrong. He's a Danish guy, Einstein is right. Do you know his theory of quantum mechanics is the mathematical formulas, the physicality of it has spawned the whole electronics industry. It's amazing. Amazing. Physics. In physics, the term light refers to electromagnetic radiation within a certain portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. You understand that, don't you? Yeah? If you don't, read the rest of Wikipedia, what I've just quoted here. (laughs) If not, download some YouTube stuff on light. 10 minutes, 15 minutes. It's brilliant. It blows your mind. You've got to see it two or three times when you don't have a physics background like I do. Um, So the word usually refers to visible light, which is the visible spectrum that is visible to the human eye and is responsible for the sense of sight. But you know, that's just one small portion of light. When you read what they say, it's like, oh, a whole pile of lights right down to gamma rays and, and it's just amazing. And then, of course, with light, the, there's two theories. It's, it's either waves, they, they've done experiments that you can see light in waves and they can measure, you know how fast light goes? 186,000 miles per second in a vacuum. But then there's other experiments and light is particles. Hey? both work but they can't be right I think the Lord has put it there just to say you're not as smart as you think figure that one out whether it's waves or whether it's particles it's both but they can't both be right you've got a hypothesis you know a sophisticated guess and you do experiments to see whether the hypothesis is correct and and when they do the test the experiments it's, it's a wave or it's, it's particles. So theories develop when there's consistent experimentation on a hypothesis, which is a sophisticated guess. So, so both theories are, are, are valid. Can't say they're true, they're just valid until they come up with another theory. <laughs> so they both work. It seems to be inconsistent. Hey, I think God's just got it there to remind us that he's around, that you're not so smart after all, you physicians, physics brains. So anyway, 
That's a little bit on, on the physics. What about biology? That's what I love, biological science. I enjoyed that. In biology, we learn that the main source of light on Earth comes from the sun. And uh, sunlight provides the energy that green plants, which you take for granted, and we still haven't figured out why they're green, why couldn't they be black or red or blue? The majority of plants are green. The little things inside of them called chlorophyll, chloroplast, they're all green. Because it's only this green stuff that somehow catches the light. And they don't really know what happens. It's just that light comes and this green stuff, chlorophyll in the chloroplast, grab it, okay? And then water coming up from the roots mixes in with it, okay? And then carbon dioxide, which is a killer, comes in through the leaves and a hundred chemical reactions and sugar is formed. Hey, starch, cellulose. And you eat the glucose, the suc becomes, and then you change it to sucrose and, or, or the, the starchy stuff and you live. Or if you don't, or you eat the animals that eat that. So you see... All that you eat comes from light. And then, of course, the plant says, oh, there's some, there's some waste matter we've got to throw out. That waste matter is called oxygen. They break down water, H2O. They remove the hydrogen kind of molecule to use it. And then they throw out the oxygen so that we can live. And that's why plant life is essential for life. That's why... Uh, I'm an environmentalist in a true sense, not, not a radical, but like killing our trees and killing plants is crazy because plants store carbon, which is not healthy, and they release oxygen, which is healthy, and they keep the balance. So, so you breathe because of light. You eat food because of light. That process is called photosynthesis. And of course, I have to say this being Greek, it comes from the Greek word, Photos, light, synthesis, which is making. So light makes food. And uh, so you've got to check it out. I mean, there, there's some great little YouTube clips about 10, 15 minutes that explain it to you. And it is, it is amazing. And um, so light energy is converted by the chlorophyll in green plants into chemical energy. And it's released to fuel all living things. It's amazing. But when you read some of these guys and and the, on the YouTube, every so often they say, yes, and it took uh, 500 million years for this to happen, and it took uh, a billion years for this to happen, and, I'm saying, and they just will not acknowledge that the God of creation, the God of the Genesis story, said, let there be light. And they come back to something that I think takes an incredible amount, it's a leap of the imagination, not rational faith. They said, oh, it, it, how did it all happen? Well, once upon a time, there was just... Bang! 14 and a half billion years ago, bang! A big bang theory. Yeah? You had to start at a particular time because the second law of thermodynamics actually says hot bodies become cold bodies. So we know the sun's going to run out. We know that. We've actually worked that out. We're all going to die. We're doomed. The sun's going to run out. The energy's going to run out. They've worked it out. It's, it's, it's a few million years ahead, but it's like... So they say, well, it had to start. And then they say, when did Earth start? Well, say four and a half billion. How do you know when it happened? They will not acknowledge that there is a master creator behind it all, as the Genesis story tells us. However, whenever he started it, I don't care if it was 50,000, 500,000, 50 million, or, or 50 billion years, when, when he created the, the, the... We just don't know dates and stuff, but we know that he is there. So... so why do I say this? Because it's interesting when you read the New Testament, the Gospels and the letters, all the time they refer to this creation story as part of how you got saved. Your conversion, you coming to Christ relates very much with how God created the physical universe. Because this physical universe was created good. The earth was good. And it was perfect. But then cosmic confusion came in. Darkness came in. Because human beings decided 
to declare unilateral independence of God. Declaration of independence, Genesis chapter 3. Going to do it on my own, God. He made us free. He made us with volition. We are philosophical. We can think about our thoughts. Animals can't. They can't think. They can think. Some animals can think a little bit, but they can't think about their thoughts. They're not philosophical. So we can think about our thoughts. So we can think about death. And, you know, how would you like to die? When would you like to die? How would, that's why we're, human beings search for meaning. Animals don't. You don't find that. Dogs praying. Cats reading their Bibles. They don't think about death. They just live and they just die. So a dog doesn't go, ooh, I better watch when I cross this road because I might die. No. He just crosses the road and either lives or dies. So human beings are made in the image of God to be creative. So we can create like God. We're amazing. So just like God thought, light, spoke, created. Human beings. When Werner von Braun back in the late 1950s, early 60s said, I think we can go to the moon. There was nothing physical they had. When he spoke to President Kennedy, they hadn't even created the... They didn't know what they were talking about. But they said, give us enough time and we'll be able to go to the moon. And Kennedy believed it. He believed. He believed. He heard the word from Werner von Braun, the famous rocket scientist. And he believed it. But there was nothing created. And within 10 years, that created the whole fabric in their minds. The engineers got to work and they put a man on the moon and brought him back again safely within 10 years. So we have the capacity to create. When Neil Bohr's, the, the, if that's the right guy's name, with quantum mechanics, he had no idea that out of this, the whole computer industry has, has come out. We wouldn't have that. So he had this mathematical formula. And what gets me with physics and mathematics is there's all these formulas out there. And I was talking to a top PhD physicist mathematician. And I said, who put those formulas there? He goes, God. Because our task is to uncover them, to find them. See, we don't create formulas. We find the formulas God has, and then they go, ooh. And then out of those formulas, like quantum mechanics, it's taken seven years, they can actually create stuff. So, so human beings can think the thoughts of God. We're amazing. Human beings needed to be living dependently on God, and they declared un- unilaterally independence. And that's why sin, S. I and I have a big I. It's independence of God. And out of that, fractured relationships occurred among our, our peers. And trouble came into the world. That's the Genesis story. So darkness was on the earth. Light came. Life occurred. Then darkness again returned into the hearts of human beings. And they were bent. Their consciences were seared. And they did some unbelievably despicable things. And they still do despicable things. And you read the story in the Bible of the, 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 the decline of humanity. Just watch the news for a week, morning and evening. And if you don't believe in the doctrine of sin, you'll be converted. Because people do some unbelievably bad things when they yield to the dark side. And so something went terribly wrong. In the conversion in the New Testament... Light and life are linked to us being spiritual new creations. It's the second thing I really want to say. New life from God comes as we have our hearts and consciences enlightened by God. You cannot receive a new heart, a new orientation, a a transformation on the in, unless your conscience, your inner life, where your values and morals and ethics are, are actually enlightened. In the New Testament, how God converts human lives is linked to the Genesis creation passage. Have a look at this. 2 Corinthians 4, 6, you may not have noticed this. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, the Genesis story, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. Wow. 
And then 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. Notice the allusion to the physical creation. The old is gone, the new is here. He's talking about the old life. And here's a key thought. A key thought. It is harder for God, much harder for God to convert your heart to change the orientation of a human being than it is for him to have created the heavens and the earth physically because there was no resistance to him he thought he spoke chung. we made in his image fallen creatures we fight all the way we have defense mechanisms rationalize and 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 will i will i not believe and and uh, what about this what's the cost going to be and so for god to break through To save you, to convert your heart, is a bigger miracle than it took in Genesis 1 to create the heavens and the earth. You were a tough nut to crack. And everyone said, you were. You know your sins. You know, if you were a pagan like me and you weren't brought up, or even, even kids brought up in a Christian church, they're pagans too. You can't have, God's not a granddaddy. He's got to become the daddy of of us all. And so even our kids growing up, you might think, oh, they're born in Christ and they're just little angels. No, they're not. They're little devils in disguise. (laughs) And you'll find out one day, they need to come to Christ. They need to, to have their hearts enlightened by God's spirit and then their inner life transformed by the presence and power of God. Now, we as parents, we create an environment of faith and love and acceptance where a child will naturally want to respond. And that's the wonder of, of, of a Christian family. And that's the great thing about Christian schools, church schools. If they create that environment, it, it's conducive for children to want to believe. But no one can force a child to believe. It's their choice. Then he says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone. And so it's much harder for God to, to change a human heart. I know for myself, look, I've, I've shared, I, I share my story all the time, but I know where I was at. It took six months, I'm 17, I'm in final year of high school, and I'm hearing the gospel, and it's six months of light, light infusion, Woo, light coming. I'm hearing Pastor Harris preach. I'm hearing my friends share about what Jesus has done for them. I'm I'm in worship services like this with the magnificent Lord leading us. I'm thinking, heaven's here. It's like worship. This is like heaven. Like, who's here? It's more than just songs. It's a presence, like God's presence. Like, so I'm getting light coming in. And then this light is, is touching my conscience. And it's revealing how dark I am. But no one knew how dark I was. On some things, I seemed to be a good boy, but I knew how how dark I was, revealing my sin, my selfishness, my greed, my lust, my anger, the dark side within that few people could see. They could see the gross things, getting drunk and taking drugs and swearing and, and, you know, playing hooky from school and and you know, being neglectful of my parents, all that stuff people could see, that I was selfish and live for myself. But the inner side, no one knew except me. And so this light infusion, it's like, oh, all this is being exposed. It's like my conscience is being affected. And, and I realized I'm learning about Jesus. And as I'm learning about Jesus, I didn't feel condemned because of my dark side. I only felt love. Almost like God saying, Bill, stop drinking poison it's going to hurt you independence is poison so to get rid of the poison give your heart over to me and I'll give you a new heart it took me six months because I enjoyed my sin I enjoyed my rebellion believe it or not I wasn't looking for Jesus but he 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 found me was looking for me and the light was coming and for six months I'm debating this. And I knew that if I came to a place where I believed, it would mess up with the way I was living. I had to make some changes and and significant changes. And uh, and I knew I was, well, man, you know, like, if this is really real, then it's true, then I I, I better live accordingly, according to it. So for six months, and then as the light is coming and my conscience is being affected, and, and I'm realizing, okay, 
I'm understanding about Jesus and the cross. And then I came to a place where I believed. And I think new life came in then, but I'm still not certain. So it was a Thursday night and I just believed. I said, yeah, I believe it all. God, yeah, yeah. I didn't close my eyes. It's true. You're real. Jesus came to earth. He is God in human form. Yes, he died on a cross for my sins. Yes, he rose again. Yes, he's in heaven and he's calling me now to turn from my old life and and he's going to give me a new life. I, I just came to the place I believed. But I think maybe new life came in even several weeks beforehand because my buddies, when they were going out witnessing, they would witness and there'd be some people going, you know, you Christians are... And I would defend the Christians. So I'd witness and I wasn't even a Christian. I know Jesus is for real. He is the truth. But I wasn't living it. I wasn't, had not yielded yet, but I'm defending him. What is that? The light was strong, so maybe then new life was beginning. You see, he regenerates us by his presence and power. He doesn't wait for us to somehow be perfect and to have some system. He just wants to see a heart that's open. And so my heart was open, but I was confused. I was uncertain. So the light came, and then ultimately, when I said yes, new life came and uh, my life was transformed. And I've seen God do this with hundreds, thousands of people here in this place. Amazing stories of, of conversion. And uh, people that, that uh, you know, were people just coming once. I remember one guy just came in once into my office. And, and it's like, he said, oh, I need Jesus. And I'm saying, well, do you understand much about him? He says, No. So what's been happening? And he goes, I just know that I've got to give my life to Jesus. And as he started talking, I'm thinking, I need to put him off maybe for a few weeks so that he reads the Bible. And, and, but, you know, he was getting revelation about Jesus from other people that had been speaking to him, though he had not read the Scriptures. And I'm trying to put him off. And he picked it up and he goes, I, I, I need to get saved now. And, All right, let's get saved. So I just led him to Christ and he'd been coming to church ever since. Then he started reading the Bible. So what's that? So light and light and life came through walking Bibles. People that had the Bible on the inside of them who were communicating and sharing. I remember another guy who came and his wife got saved. And uh, he was very angry that his wife became a Christian because they were pagan, totally pagan. So he would drop her off at church and by golly, she had to be at the door right on when the service finished. Sort of drive up drop her up, then do a wheelie and take off, just to let us know that he wasn't happy. And uh, so anyway, then after several weeks, he used to park at the end of the car park, and out of the car park, there's smoke billowing out the windows, like, like it was a chimney, cans of beer and smoking, and nobody would venture near there because you thought, man, the vibe will kill you. Anyway, then he, after a few weeks, he, he gets out of the car and just starts walking to and fro a little bit, you know? And again, you didn't want to go near him because the vibe was... And then he just, no, interestingly, he kept on walking closer to the entrance. Then one day, after several months, he did a very, very foolish thing. He walked in. <laughs> and he sat down at the back. And you could see, over a period of several weeks, probably took a couple of months, where the light is coming. And there was a Chinese man that just befriended him. He was in the church, just a very, very quiet guy, just befriended him, and they just would talk, have a cup of coffee, and, uh, and then one day, I don't know who was preaching, but he's at the back, and the altar call is given, like, would you like to accept Jesus? And I'll do that today, so some of you may need to do it, and said, like, and the Chinese man goes up to him, and taps him on the shoulder, and says, um, Charlie, I think it's time. And with that, he bursts into tears, falls into his arm and comes like walking, crawling out the front, giving his life to Christ. This boozing, smoking, swearing, violent man. He wasn't a very happy chappy. He's like a little baby. His heart is soft and he became a wonderful Christian. He ended up serving in missionary service overseas. Who can do that? No psychologist can do that. No educator can do that. No one can change the the human heart. We're very strong. And it takes more grace, more power, more light to do that, harder for God to do that than 
to create the physical world. You are a new creation. And if you have gone through this process, then you're a walking miracle. This is new life. This is new birth. This is being born from above. This is the transformation of the orientation of a human heart. And only God can do that. And it's only through Jesus Christ that that can happen. Jesus is the author of both light and life. Now, again, you see the linkage with Genesis. Have a read of John chapter 1 and put Genesis chapter 1 next to it and put 2 Corinthians 4 and 5 next to it. In the beginning was the Word. And God said the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God, Logos. Wonderful word concept, the Logos. He was with God in the beginning. Hey, Jesus was there? Yep. Not as Jesus of Nazareth, as the eternal Son of God. He becomes Jesus of Nazareth only when he let go of his right to remain as the eternal Son of God. And forever now he'll be the eternal Son of God, Jesus of Nazareth. He will always look like a 33-year-old Palestinian Jewish man with great big wounds on him. But he was there in the beginning, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. And look at this. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. Wow, Jesus who made this physical universe and the world we live in, he can recreate you today. Like he did with that, that man. And with so many other people. Maybe you've been coming here for a while and uh, you're on the journey. Light has come. But, you know, you're, it's time now for new life to enter in. Well, maybe it has. You can be transformed and become a new creation. God can recreate something in you today as you take communion with us. As you take a little bit of biscuit, a little bit of wine and say, Lord Jesus, I don't understand it all. But I know what I'm eating and what I'm drinking speaks of your death on the cross for me. It speaks that you love me. You love me so much you died in my place. And you rose again. You went to heaven and you sent the Holy Spirit to empower us to be able to communicate and share about you. You can be recreated today by the light and life of God. You can have a new creation story. Let him light up your life and to give you this new life that is eternal life. You will never die. You will never die. You will live forever and ever and ever with him. The assurance that you know where you're going. That night when I got, made my commitment on a Sunday night at church, I believed on the Thursday night, I put my hand up at church and I came out the front and, and uh, was just so happy. As I'm crossing the road to go into my dad's white valiant, still remember that, I'm crossing the road, <laughs> that's the weirdest, I'm thinking, I'm floating. And I'm a hard-headed realist, okay, I'm a historian and scientist, both, I love science and I love history, I'm like, my feet are firmly planted on the ground, I'm not into, ooh, the weird stuff. This wasn't weird, it was real, it was like, what's happening to me? I stopped in the middle of the road and I actually checked my feet. What's, what's happening? It's like I, was, I had a hovercraft underneath. And I was floating and I, I didn't realise what was happening. I just felt this lightness of being. Now I knew. Six months of the light coming in and all the turmoil of guilt and fear and shame and sin and I finally knew I was forgiven. I knew my sins had been forgiven. That I was saved. No more shame, no more fear. I exposed everything to God and he loved me as I am and forgave me of all my many sins and all my future sins. I knew that I was safe and secure because I knew God's love for me revealed itself on a cross and there's nothing I could do to make God love me more or nothing I could do to make God love me less. He loves me full stop and he died in my place and I was safe and secure. And, I, and, I, and, and then I went into the car and I had this strange thought, what if I got killed tonight? a weird thought I'm 17 what if I got killed and then this feeling came in like you're going to heaven not that I wanted to die I just it was like, like I wanted to live but like I knew where I was going I had no fear I knew where I was going 
I'm going to heaven. Heaven is real. I watched the funeral of, of the late President George H.W. Bush. If you watch a fantastic funeral service. I mean, his son, George W., and then his secretary of state, James Baker, strong Christians. And one, the, the thing that broke everyone up was, was when, when President George W. Bush said, Dad, you're in heaven, because he was a very strong Christian, and, and you're there with Robin, the little girl they had that died when she was three years of age with leukemia. And, and Dad, we see you hugging her and holding Mum's hand. And it was as real as can be. These are presidents. These are secretaries of state. These are intelligent, brilliant people. But the light has come into their soul. George W. said he was a hopeless alcoholic. At 40 years of age, he knew his life was going down the tube. He's loved his dad and Billy Graham spoke to him. And George, who died, the father, brought Billy in. He said, I think you need to talk to my son. So he set it up. And so Billy spoke to George Jr. And after that, he gave his life to Christ, stopped drinking, and he's never had a drink since then. Gave his life to Christ. Strong Christian man. Whether you agree with their policies or not, it's a di different story. But like, so, so to me, when, when I saw the film, I thought, man, this is fantastic. Millions of people are watching this. Heaven is real. There is an assurance that if you have faith in Christ, You've been recreated for an eternity, a place of perfection where there'll be no more tears, no more pain, no more sorrow, no more sickness, no more death, no more Satan, that the, the condition of what it was like in the Garden of Eden will return. Genesis chapter 20, sorry, Revelation 20, 21 tells us the picture of, of a restored Garden of Eden. That's what heaven is going to be like. Everything we have here on earth except for sin and darkness and, and evil. You can experience that today let me lead you in a prayer father thank you for these amazing verses in genesis 1 and john chapter 1 and 2 corinthians 4 and 5 of 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 the whole notion of of you being the author of light to sustain this physical universe that we live in that all that we eat and all that we can breathe comes because you're the author of life and that light leads to life and thank you Lord for the not just the illusions but the references of the new creation that comes through Jesus Christ that again you remind us of your creative genius in Genesis 1 and that you desire to enlighten every man every woman every boy every girl with the message that Jesus is real that he's alive that he can change the orientation of our hearts and he can cause miracles to occur and Lord as that light comes then you give new life to those who say yes Jesus I believe and I receive you Lord I pray today as we come around your table that for those who have never ever personally believed may they believe today and receive Jesus as their personal saviour and Lord for all of us touch us Spirit of God, move among us and uh, bring light and bring life into our lives, our spirits, our minds, our bodies, our circumstances as we celebrate, Lord, this wonderful ordinance that speaks of the cross that made it all possible. Amen. Ushers, you come and bring the emblems of communion to us. And, and church, this is the Lord's table. If you're one of our guests here today, maybe you're not a regular at Christian Family Centre, this is not our table. This is the table of Jesus and he invites you. He doesn't reject you and say, well, this is now dinner time, you've got to go. He says, stay, enter in. Even if you haven't yet received him, but everything within you is saying, I'd like to respond to him. These emblems can help you. They're physical things you can touch and feel and drink that speak of an eternal truth that he loves you, that he died for you, that he rose for you, that he's praying for you, that he sends the Holy Spirit to enlighten our hearts and to give us new life, forgiveness, salvation, reconciliation, eternal life. So take it with us. If you want to let it pass by, that's fine. But this is the Lord's table and he meets with us as we take these emblems by faith. Thank you, ushers. Wait upon us.